Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman. It's September 6th, 2014, and this is episode 15. The theme for this week is keeping it interesting. So this is recording number two. (laughs) If you follow me on Instagram at all, uh, you know that I have had some trouble with the, actually not so much the recording this week as the editing. I've gone back to my original camera because uh, I spent about 12 hours trying to get the audio and the video synced up while I was editing my podcast. And I realized that was just foolish. It was just time to start over again. So hopefully, fingers crossed, this will work. Uh, If not, I will be releasing this into the world and then I will be smashing my computer into a thousand tiny bits because... It is the computer's fault. (laughs) Make no mistake. Okay, so I have a a few things to talk with you about today. The the keeping it interesting part is uh, it's kind of basically my thoughts on the theme of those times when you're knitting something and you just get to that boring part. You know, either the long stretch of stockinette or the project wasn't really all that exciting to begin with. It's something that you really want or that somebody you love really wants, and it looks gorgeous, but it's just not really that interesting to knit. So I have some ideas about how to inject some life back into those projects or to to inject them, inject some life into them from the start. Um, In the process of talking about that, I have a, our first yarn review for you. Um, like I said in a in my previous podcast, I was interested in hearing what you all thought about uh, whether I should do some reviews or not. And the resounding answer was that yes, you would like to see those. And so I'm going to go ahead and do the first review today. I will say I appreciate all your feedback because some of you gave me some very specific feedback about what kinds of reviews you would like to see. Uh, so most of, really the vast majority of you said, yes, you wanted to see them, but some of you said, I'd really only like to see them if they're, re- if you're reviewing stuff that hasn't been reviewed multiple times on other podcasts, or I'd really like to see in-depth reviews and not just, hey, look at this pretty thing kind of, kind of reviews. So I, I totally get that. And in fact, that's, that's really kind of in keeping with what I wanted to do anyway. So... I just realized how terrible that sounded. Thank you for confirming the views I already have. And because I already have them, I'm going to accept your feedback. (laughs) Anyways, we will do reviews like that. And I've also, uh, so far I've been in touch with Stitchcraft Marketing, which is a group that uh, helps, basically helps a lot of uh, smaller independent companies market their stuff. So they're, they're kind of a clearinghouse for things to be sent out to review. And what I've told them is that I'm particularly interested in uh, yarns and, and patterns and books and so on that are about unusual construction or that have something a little offbeat about them or that are particularly ga- aimed at men and boys. And you'll see in the in the yarn review for this week that is that last thing is the, the hook for this particular yarn. Uh, no crochet pun intended. (laughs) Um, so they're going to, I'll I'll kind of keep things focused on a, you know, somewhat more niche market, but I think even if you're not interested in those things, you'll, you'll be interested in seeing some of this stuff. So anyway, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, a few announcements before we get into all of that. Uh, one of them is, that I wanted to say thank you to a very kind viewer who actually is also a podcast host herself. Uh, I'm talking about Kimber Lolly. That's the name she goes by on social media. And her actual name is Kimberly Gintar. Um, She is an American living in Berlin, Germany. And uh, just very nicely, just to be sweet, sent me a copy of one of her most recent patterns. And I love it. And I have to show it to you because not only do I want to thank her, but I also want you to see this because it's fantastic. So uh, I make no secret about my being nerdy. And so that she was sending it to me in this vein. 
this is her pattern. And <laughs> sorry, there's a little bit of a glare. It's called the Botleth, and if you're a Star Trek fan at all, you will immediately recognize it as the two-handed Klingon sword. <laughs> and it's a scarf! How clever is that? And you can probably see in the second picture here that um, the, the first picture, it's just it's laying flat on the ground. So there it looks just like the sword. But once you put it on, it just looks like this cool kind of geometric asymmetrical scarf. And I just I think it's so clever, you know, that it can have both this, um, you know, kind of symbolic realism with the scarf, but then also really look like this cool scarf. And um, <laughs> I love this third photo of her. <laughs> ah, like the look on her face. That is so great. Uh, and clearly she, what I think is so clever about this is she's lying down. So it looks like she's wielding this sword, but actually she's kind of gripping it from underneath. Very, very clever. And uh, I, I looked through the pattern. The construction is both very clever and also well explained. So... If you are a Star Trek or science fiction fan at all, this is definitely one to pick up. It's, again, called The Botleth, B-A-T apostrophe L-E-T-H, by Kimberly Gintar. And thank you so much, Kimberly, for sending that to me. That was um, such a highlight of my week. <laughs> um, oh, and I also wanted to say about the pattern. Um, so it's, the pattern is $6, and then... She has a friend who dyes the yarn that is in, you know, just those right colors to look, to really look like the sword. So if you buy the kit from her, from her friend, the pattern comes free with that. And um, she didn't ask me to say all this, by the way. I just looked it up. Uh, she has a number of other really gorgeous shawl and accessory patterns. And uh, her podcast, if you'd like to watch it, is uh, called The Giving Flower. And I've watched a couple of episodes of it. It's, it's a really nice podcast. Definitely recommend it. So thank you very much, Kimberly. That was, that was very fun. I also want to remind you in the announcements portion that uh, September 11th, which is less than a week from now, is the last day to enter my uh, Kung Fu Knits pre-launch giveaway. My book is coming out on the 15th. And uh, I have a little contest going on Ravelry and other social media where you can post a picture of your, it doesn't have to be your kid, a kid wearing something that you have knitted or crocheted. And, uh, and you can post it on my Ravelry group. You can post it on my Facebook group one time per each social medium, please. Um, so Ravelry group, Facebook group, uh, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram, and on those last three, Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, if you put the hashtag Kung Fu Knits, I'll find it. So each one of those entries will, each time you post, will get you an entry into a drawing for uh, copies of the book, for uh, yarn to knit projects in the book, um, some really cute ninja stitch markers, or uh, a ninja project bag. And I've shown all of these prizes on previous episodes, so I won't uh, I won't belabor that again. But uh, if you get a chance, you have to go look at the the Ravelry thread, which is where most people have been posting their photographs. They, there are some incredibly sweet photos, and there are some really funny ones. <laughs> the ones of the kids crying. <laughs> Oh, they just make me laugh so hard. It's like, yeah, this is this is what it's really like to knit for kids, isn't it? Sometimes. I mean, I know some of them are really good, but about wearing knitwear, but there are just those times where it's like, yes, I spent hours and hours making for this for you, and now you are crying. Win-win. Okay, so that is uh, oh and I actually a couple other things about the book I'm so excited you guys because I'm actually doing book signings <laughs> this is so funny to me because I've actually written a book before in my previous life as a historian I wrote an academic book in history of science and um it's now remaindered and I think maybe sold a thousand copies over the course of its actual active book status I never did a book signing um, I think I signed my mom's book, and that was about it. <laughs> uh, so having book signings, 
chloral setup for my Kung Fu Knits book is so exciting. I mean, it would be anyway, but it just sort of adds an extra layer of a depth of flavor to the excitement. So the first one is October 11th here in Austin. Uh, one of my lovely local yarn stores has invited me to, during the yarn crawl, which is even better, to come do a book signing. And uh, so that's the knitting nest if you happen to live in this area. October 11th, two to four, and I'm trying to arrange a uh, self-defense demonstration by one of the Kung Fu teachers at my son's school. So it'll be extra Kung Fu. And hopefully my, I'm planning on having my son there as well so he can do some nunchuck demonstrations. Yeah. And then I'm still setting this up, but hopefully we'll have a book signing in Chicago. I know, like travel, travel for book signings. Um, I won't go into the details yet, but we'll hopefully we'll be setting that up soon. And I will be at Rhinebeck. So if you are there, uh, do come by the Cooperative Press booth on Saturday. And I will be uh, kind of informally signing books there. I'm also be will be working at the booth, and um, and then we'll just be walking around Rhinebeck on Sunday. Super excited about that too. Okay, so that's announcements for today. Let's get into the heart of the matter, which is uh, the the whole keeping it interesting theme. And actually, I think I'm going to start with the yarn review because it kind of fits in with this whole idea and uh, kind of shows you what I've been working on this week. I've pretty much been working on this exclusively because, uh, I don't know, I just really wanted, I'm an overachiever, okay? I really wanted my first review to be like a review, you know, with teeth. <laughs> Sometimes I just have to laugh at myself. Okay, so I made a sock with the yarn I'm reviewing. <laughs> and I'm going to make the other one. I've already started it. So, the yarn in question, let's not get ahead of ourselves, is Mountain Colors Crazy Foot. And here's the tag. Mountain Colors, you have probably encountered them before. They've been around since 1992. And uh, they're at a lot of shows. If you've gone to any uh, fiber events, you have probably seen them there. And they're in a lot of yarn shops. I mean, they're definitely not they're not a small indie. I would say they're, uh, I would guess they're probably roughly the size of somebody like a Malabrigo or something like that. So um, a very successful initially, in you know, well, they are independent. They're their own shop. Uh, the color I am working with, Crazy Foot is a fingering weight yarn that is 90% superwash merino, 10% uh, nylon, and has 425 yards in a hundred gram skein. So it's one of those one skein makes a pair of socks kind of uh, put ups. And it's definitely enough to make a good sized pair of socks. My husband wears uh, what a nine and a half or a 10 in men's. And uh, granted he wanted a shorter cuff, but I'm going to have more than enough to way more than enough to make him a pair of socks. Uh, because it's super wash, this is machine wash. And, um, the color I am working with is Harmony Moss. By the way, still a small enough company that they've handwritten the name of the, the colorway on here, which is charming. And they're based in Corvallis, Montana, which it says here on the, the front of the tag. Um, so one of the reasons why I specifically requested Mountain Colors, actually, because they're one of those yarns that they've kind of, you know, they've been around for a while. Um, the, the colors are, tend to be very muted and earthy. They're not the kind of, they don't do self-striping. They don't do, they're not trendy. I guess that's the, the way I want to put it is that they, they make, they do beautiful yarns, but they're not the ones that are just going to leap out at you from the table as you're walking around stitches or wherever you are or the yarn store. They are, the kind of yarn that when you're um, knitting a pair of socks for somebody with very restrained taste in color, these are the yarns that you want to go for. And so what kind of, the way that this fits in with the, the theme that I want to talk about for today is that I really think there ought to be a place for those yarns too, and that we ought to perhaps appreciate them more, that 
The kind of understated elegance of a yarn like this is well worth keeping around. This is a really nice yarn, I have to say. It's nice to be able to start with a, with a positive review. The color is beautiful. You know, you may not immediately gravitate to olive green, but this is a really beautiful olive green. Uh, it's got lots of gorgeous yellow undertones in it that really bring it to life. This is not olive drab. This is olive green. <laughs> and um, it's, it's actually not quite as, as bright as it's coming out on the camera. It's a little bit more muted than this. But it does have these really nice uh, teal accents in it. It's a classic variegated yarn in that if you, depending on how it knits up, it tends to pool and kind of sort of stripe. Um, I really like that. And in fact, one, one suggestion while we're talking about this issue of, um, of pooling yarn, if you are working on something like this and you don't like the way something is pooling, like for example, I've made pairs of socks where, uh, all the color pooled on, like th there were basically two colors and say all the teal pooled on this side and all the olive pooled on this side, which is not really my favorite. All you need to do is uh, change the needle size or alter the number of stitches. And you don't have to do it by much. Usually it just takes a few stitches or maybe one needle size to just throw off the placement of the color just that much so that uh, everything gathers up differently on the, on the sock or the hat or whatever you're working on. So, um, so yeah, I really like the way this knits up. The, the feel of it is, is really nice. I mean, it's definitely not uh, the softest merino in the world. And I think the reason for that is that it has a pretty tight twist. So I'll show you, let's see if I can get this to kind of focus on the perhaps a little bit hard to see, but you can kind of see right here, for example, how the twist is almost horizontal. You know, it's twisted so tightly that it's almost horizontal instead of diagonal. The reason that they've done that is because uh, that tight twist allows the yarn to be harder wearing. So it takes away some of the softness, but it means that these socks are going to last a long time. So I would say the feel of this is somewhere in between one of those really, really soft merino sock yarns that you pick up and you're like, oh. Somewhere between that and, uh, and Regia or Opal, you know, which had this very sturdy woolen feel to them. Um, so it, it's definitely still soft and it's quite, quite smooshy, but it's not, uh, it's not buttery soft, which I'm perfectly fine with. I mean, these are very comfortable socks. They don't have to be, they don't have to feel like cashmere to be soft. So the feel is very nice. Uh, as I say, the dye work is really lovely. When I washed these, a little bit of green came out, but nothing, nothing dire. Uh, <laughs> dire. <laughs> oh man, I'm punchy from having worked on this pod, this episode too long. Mm. But yeah, not, not, uh, not so much dye that it was a problem. But you definitely, I think the first time you, you hand wash or wash a pair of anything that you've hand knit, especially yarn that's hand dyed, you want to do it separately anyway. I definitely got the sense that if I wash this again, there's not going to be any dye that comes out. I think I exhausted all of it. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to say about this, this yarn? I had a whole bunch of notes. Oh yeah, so in terms of the the quality of the yarn. Uh, I know that one thing that kind of drives people crazy sometimes is when there are a lot of knots in a skein. Uh, I only, I've only encountered one knot so far. And otherwise, what I've encountered is the occasional, I think maybe two or three in the whole skein so far, occasional uh, kind of spit splice area, you know, where the, the machine has probably pulled the yarn apart and then they've just basically spit spliced it back together so that it's one continuous piece, but there's this little floofy bit in the middle that's a little bit thicker than the rest of the yarn, which 
uh, given that you just have to expect that there's going to be some breakage when you're you're working with a, a commercially made uh, d yarn base, I think that's a, a perfectly reasonable. It's a better solution than the knot for sure, and perfectly reasonable to expect. Um, the the ply structure is. Um, as I said, a very tight twist. Sorry, I'm looking around for my little cut piece here. It's a very tight twist, and um, this is probably, I would say, it's a pretty healthy fingering weight. Um, I mean, I'm getting, I'm getting seven stitches to the inch, but I'm knitting it pretty, pretty tightly. Um, the way that it is plied is it's a four ply. So if you kind of rough up the edges and start pulling them apart, what it tends to do is split into, into half. And then you can pull apart in each one of those halves, you can pull another couple of plies apart. Now, why is this interesting? And in fact, this is kind of my technique segment for, for the day. I'm kind of incorporating that in here into the yarn review which is looking at the ply structure of your yarns a little more carefully and how to do that and what it means. Um, these four plies, when they're all put together, are, are what makes this yarn, what gives this yarn its kind of plump roundness, which for a sock yarn is great because it both gives some cushioning to the sock and also allows you to get really good stitch definition. So if you're going to do any cabling especially or any knit and purl textures like I've done with this one, this is just a uh, broken rib, uh, it really allows, it really plumps those stitches out and gives them a little more three-dimensional structure so that the the shadows that form in between the stitches really you know pop everything out. So Anytime you have three plies or more in a yarn, that's the kind of effect you're going to get. The tighter the twist and the more plies, the more that stitch definition is just going to pop right out. Uh, if you have two plies, so here is an example. This is a fairly thick example of a two ply. But if I, this is a Barocco yarn and I'm forgetting what the name of this yarn is. Uh, it's been out for a while. But if I start, you know, kind of plucking at the edges of this, immediately two plies start coming out. And if I try to pull these apart anymore, it just it just fluffs. It doesn't actually pull apart into plies, it's just making kind of a mess up here. So this is a two ply. Now, this is not going to have the same kind of stitch definition that a three or more ply yarn will have. And why is that? Well, it's because the fewer plies you have, the easier it is for the yarn to kind of squash flat and subsequently for your stitches to kind of smoosh down, which is great for lace. Um, not so great for cables or knit pearl texture, any kind of textured stitches, but super great for lace. Um, now this is a pretty big yarn for lace, but a lot of lace yarns, um, some fingering weight and a lot of lace weight yarns, are done in this two-ply structure because they really flatten out and stay flattened out when you block them. So you really get that, that fully spread out, flattened uh, lace structure. Whereas you may have noticed this if you've ever tried to knit a lace yarn, a lace pattern with a fingering weight yarn that has that is really plump, that the when you block it out, the, the lace kind of tends to want to spring back into a smaller shape again. And that's because of the, the ply structure of the yarn. So you really want, if you if you're knitting something where blocking that lace way out is a big part of the success of the project, use a two ply, not a three ply or more. Here's another example. This is a, a multi-ply yarn. I think it's actually got eight plies in it, which I know because I've already recorded this podcast. <laughs> but yeah, if I start pulling this apart up here, I start getting multiple 
Oh, wait, actually, I think it's six. But yeah, it's a, it's a really... It's what it's one of the reasons why. It's not just because this is merino, but it's also because it has six plies. This yarn, which is a, a Malabrigo superwash, also forgetting what this is. These are just scrap balls that I've got lying around. Um, but it's one of the it's one of the main reasons why this is such a smooshy yarn is because all that all those plies are really giving it a lot of uh, a lot of bounce, and this will make great stitch, stitch definition. Uh, one other example I wanted to show you, because this is kind of the other main type of um, of yarn structure. Sorry, fell on the floor. Hang on. Here we go. Uh, another type of, another, the other main type of yarn structure is called chainette construction. And um, and that is where, this is Lindy Chain, which is a, a, a new Knit Picks yarn. Um, that's where... The yarn is is actually a single that has been turned into an I-cord, and the I-cord itself is the yarn. So this is going to be a little tricky to see. Let me see if I can block my face out so it's not focusing on me. Yeah, it's not really going to focus on this, unfortunately. But um, the way that you can tell that you've... Imagine a really fine I-cord. The way that you can tell that this is a chainette construction if you can't see it by looking closely and seeing this I-cord structure, is that if you try to pull apart the, um, the plies, you won't be able to do it because it's all, you know, sort of knitted up on itself. It's not just twisted around. So I'm just kind of making a mess here when I try to, to pull apart the plies because it's, it's an I-cord, not a twist. Now, why is this done this way? Um, it's because, well, a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is that typically you will find this kind of construction when uh, you've got a fiber that doesn't normally have a lot of bounce back on its own. So this is a cotton linen blend, and if you've ever knitted with cotton and linen before, you know it's got excellent drape, but it doesn't really bounce back to its original shape very easily. Like, you actually have to wash a cotton piece before it'll bounce back to its previous shape. Uh, so this kind of takes that quality of cotton and linen and adds some artificial bounce into it so that a cotton or linen piece could hold its shape a little better. So I have this because that um, tank top that I designed, the Arezzo tank, is like I really wanted it to maintain its shape because it's a little more fitted. So this is the perfect kind of yarn for that. Uh, you will also see this kind of yarn construction a lot with alpaca, because alpaca also has a very uh, drapey quality to it, unlike wool, or more, more so than wool. Um, but it doesn't really bounce back very well. But if you chain ply an alpaca uh, ply, it will kind of add a little more, a little more bounce to it. So right there in the middle of my yarn review, a little bit about ply structure. Um, back to the yarn, let's see, there were a few other things I wanted to mention about it. Um, the, the colors are really beautiful. This is actually one of the more muted colors that they have, but they tend to be, like I said, very foresty, very earthy, uh, very tr sort of traditionally popular colors, lots of navies and burgundies and uh, pine greens and uh, mustardy yellows, uh, really lovely dye work. Um, you're not going to see orchid in there. <laughs> well, you might, but it's not really their thing, right? Um, and I looked around to kind of see how much it retails for generally. It's usually anywhere, somewhere between $21 and $26, which is tends to be kind of on the low end actually for a hand dyed skein of sock yarn so it's quite reasonably priced i have uh very nicely mountain colors also sent well actually stitch crack marketing by way of or mountain colors by way of stitch crack marketing sent a an additional skein to do as a giveaway for you all which i thought was very nice and this colorway is called harmony mallard it's the exact same base, but just dyed with, it's got more blues in it. I thought this might be more appealing to you all. 
uh, really, really lovely. As you can see, it's um, and it, it's not quite as bright as it's appearing on the screen. It's a little more grayed out than this. Uh, that's a little better. It's a little darker than that, though. It's um, kind of a very dark, almost turquoisey blue, and then um, some olive greens in it, and it just really has a nice, nice finish to it. So this skein will go to uh, someone on the next podcast. So sometime between now and the next podcast, a couple of weeks from now, um, if you will go to the Ravelry group, the Dark Matter Knits Ravelry group, and uh, post a link to your favorite men's pattern, that will be the, the prompt for this giveaway. So you need to be a member of the group. There will be a thread for this giveaway. And I'm going to ask you, as I said, to give us a link to your favorite men's pattern. It doesn't have to be something that you've knit, just something that you really appreciate. And it doesn't need to be for fingering weight yarn either. Okay, so we'll give this away on the next podcast. And I want to thank uh, Mari Chibaluk for sending that to me. Um, she got this to me really quickly, and I'm really enjoying working with it. The last thing I want to say about it is that the, the sock pattern that I'm working on is, uh, it's called the Strie Toe Up pattern, and it's from this book, Sock Architecture by Laura Neal, which if you've been listening to podcasts for a while, you may have listened to the Math for Knitters podcast, and this is uh, the host of that podcast. I think she's been, she hasn't been podcasting for a while, but I think she's going to be getting back into it. And uh, the pattern is this one, Strie Toe Up. And it's just a really nice uh, toe up sock pattern. Nothing too fancy. Um, like I said, this is a broken rib here. What I really liked about it is that uh, there are tons of sizes in here. This book is all about uh, basically custom designing and fitting a sock for you. So she has sock patterns in here, but the first really two thirds, half to two thirds of the book is all about how to measure yourself, how to get the right numbers, how to choose a toe for the, your particular foot, uh, what the particular qualities of different heels are, and, and then you can really kind of plug and play into, and, and really kind of create your own favorite vanilla sock pattern. And then the patterns in the back give specific numbers for you know, child, women's, medium, etc. But, um, but also give you the formulas to figure it out specifically just for your size. So you can really customize it to fit your foot. So it's, it's a really great book for people who are willing to take a little extra time to do some good measurement and really get a good fit. Um, so I think actually I'm going to end up making this my new go-to sock pattern because I really like doing toe up socks. I don't know why I just do. I like doing toe top down too. I don't have any problem with either one, but I just really like doing toe up. It starts with a, uh, this one starts with Judy's magic cast on, which I really like and does a kind of standard wedge toe, which fits my foot and my husband's foot really well. Um, what I really liked that I hadn't done before was this uh, toe up gusset construction, which I don't think that Laura came up with, but it's just a well-written uh, version of that construction. And um, so you basically still have a gusset in here. And what I really liked about it, and this is the big selling point for me, is that you do the heel flap, which fits, again, my foot and my husband's foot really well, but there's no picking up stitches. Um, I probably shouldn't get too much into how it's done, but basically you're kind of knitting stitches together along here instead of picking them up. And that means dun, da, 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 there is no gap, none whatsoever. You know that place where you always get that little hole when you're doing top down gusseted socks? None. That is not sewn up people. The, the ends are weaving it, woven in on this sock, but I did not close that up at all. That's just how it was from the get go. Awesome. And then uh, she has a different bind off, but I just used uh, Jenny's surprising, Jenny surprisingly stretchy bind off at the top because I really like that one. But then you knew that already. Been watching for a while, but yeah, it's just a you know a really basic 
sock, but really well written. And I really, really like how I like knitting it. I really like how it fits. So bonus on that. Um, okay. So talk, talk a little more generally about, uh, keeping things interesting with potentially dull knitting, because I was thinking about this as I was knitting this sock, like, okay, I'm knitting an olive, olive green sock, a men's olive green sock. So bigger than, than usual, although not that much bigger than my foot, honestly. And, uh, you know, a, it's got a stitch pattern, but it's not a, it's not a complex stitch pattern because I mean, my, my husband, honestly, will, he would wear a lot of different things, but I just wanted, I just wanted a basic sock to try this out. So, um, it got me thinking about, uh, those times when you're just kind of bored by your knitting and how to, how to get around that. How do you solve the problem of just kind of dull knitting? So I had a few thoughts about that. Um, one of them is obviously with this, I could have just knit a stockinette sock and I thought about doing that, but especially because this is a variegated yarn and I didn't want to get bored in the middle, I just put a little bit of texture in there. It's not a lot, you know, it's just knit one purl one on one row and knit on the next. It's not complicated, but it was just enough to kind of keep things motoring along a little more. So a lot of times just a little bit of texture can be a great thing. And I also think there's something to be said, tip number two, something to be said for boring knitting, because sometimes that's all you can handle, either because it's been a really long day or because you're watching TV or because you're talking to someone, it's knit night. There are lots of, lots of times when the boring knitting project is really all I want. In fact, like the most distressing thing to me is when I don't have a boring knitting project on the needles and like, I really, really need one. <laughs> and the, the thought of having to come up with a pattern and cast one on and choose the yarn. And it's just like, oh, <gasps> you know, <laughs> there's something to be said for dull knitting. Okay. But so, you know, let's pretending like that's like we recognize that, but sometimes it's hard to kind of motor through them. What do you do? Uh, another technique you can use is to try projects with interesting constructions. So there are lots of patterns out there that on their face, like when you look at them as finished garments, don't look like they're very complicated, but they're just put together in an unusual way. Like they're, you know, a sweater that's knit from side to side or uh, it's knit from the top down with no seams. And so there's some interesting, uh, kind of magic that has to happen to make all that work. And I find that this is particularly good when you're knitting for somebody who has very conservative clothing tastes is to find something that looks very classic, but has unusual construction, because that will mean, you know, knitting them the plain Navy non-textured sweater in stockinette will have some interest to it, right? Like, uh, and actually one of the men's sweaters I designed, I did this with exactly this in mind. Um, the, well, actually a couple of them, the Colonel Henley that I did for Spud and Chloe. And um, why am I forgetting the name of my own sweater? The Bailey Island cardigan, which I self-published. Both of those are top down saddle shoulder construction. So they have very classic shapes. Actually, the Bailey Island cardigan is asymmetrical, but um, otherwise they have very classic shapes. But you start with the collar and then you do this funky thing where you build out the shoulders all at once. And um, with a whole bunch of crazy short rows, there's like one row that's almost a quarter of a page long. <laughs> it's crazy insane. And I was so proud of myself for figuring it out. Uh, but it, it's fun, you know, it kind of turns this, what would otherwise be, you know, a bit of a slog to knit through. It adds a, a, a layer of interest to it that I think, you know, kind of makes the sweater. So look around for unusual constructions. And I, in fact, I even, when I'm favoriting things on Ravelry, I will tag them with a the tag unusual construction, just so I can go back later and find those because I think they're really fun to knit. Um, you can also inject some surprise into your knitting 
by kind of doing it artificially. So one of my favorite ways of doing this is, uh, this has been out for a while, but Lee Meredith, who is a Portland, Oregon based designer, I believe, uh, she goes by Lethal on Ravelry, L-E-E-T-H-A-L. She has a, a pattern booklet called Game Knitting that is, um, it's really clever. It's basically, it's kind of like a drinking game, but with knitting. So you basically set up these rules for yourself, like say you were watching a TV show. Um, you set up these rules for yourself in advance that every time a character says this word, you're going to do a yarn over. Or every time there's a scene change, you're going to change colors. Or uh, that really popular, completely separate from Lethal's thing, but that very popular scarf right now that a number of people are knitting, uh, where you put in a stripe every time your, your favorite team wins a game at home and then a different colored stripe when they lose and a different colored stripe when they win it away game. And like, that's another kind of example of this where you're not really doing particularly complicated knitting, but you're letting the environment kind of change, change up every now and then what stitch you're doing or what color you're working with. So I think that's a really fun idea. Um, and then I also thought about, I believe this is a concept that the Yarn Harlot came up with originally, and I'll link to her blog post where she talks about this. Uh, but there's also the idea of, like, let's say you're bored with your stash. Um, a way of kind of injecting some life back into it is to, uh, like she did this with sock yarn, where she took out 12 skeins of sock yarn that she'd had for a while, put them all in Ziploc, Ziploc baggies with, and I think she puts a pattern in with each one as well. Um, so one pattern, one skein in each Ziploc bag. And every month she randomly chooses one of these bags and casts on the socks. And, and a number of people have mimicked this ever since, especially using paper bags so you can't see what's inside. Um, which I think is a really clever idea, a nice way to kind of re-enliven your stash by, by making it an element of surprise. So, you know, there are lots of ways of, um, of, you know, kind of making your knitting more interesting at times when, you know, it really doesn't seem to have that kind of potential. And if you have ideas, I'd be really interested in hearing them. If you've got patterns that you think are, you know, really good for kind of keeping you going or uh, that have unusual construction or, you know, just any other ideas that you have for kind of re-injecting some life into your knitting, uh, getting that mojo back, that would be, share them with us in the, in the Ravelry thread, um, in the group, the Dark Matter Knits group. And I believe, yes, I believe that is all for today. You can find me as Dark Matter Knits Now everywhere. I actually just changed my Ravelry name from Elizabeth GM to Dark Matter Knits, so that's now me. Um... So I'm Dark Matter Knits on Ravelry, Facebook, or, well, yeah, sort of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, my website is darkmatterknits.com. You can find show notes there and other information. And I will see you in a couple of weeks. Actually, the episode next, next time may be a little late because I'm going to be teaching at the Arkansas Fiber Arts Extravaganza, but I will get it posted as soon as I can. Okay, talk to you later. Bye.